Okay, um, I think we'll start. Welcome everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Um, I'm Amy Keating, I'm president of the Protein Society and I'm just gonna kick things off by briefly introducing the society and making a few announcements while people are still logging in. Um, the Protein Society was born in 1985 and is now an international organization with members from 30 countries. We publish the journal Protein Science and we run an annual symposium that covers a wide range of topics all related to proteins. This summer we had planned to run the World Conference on Protein Science in Sapporo, Japan in collaboration with the Protein Science Society of Japan and the Asia Pacific Protein Association. In fact, that meeting should have been going on right now and oh i have a slide about that yeah, okay and um we're all really sad that we're not there and about the loss of that opportunity and also the tireless work of many that went into organizing that conference today's webinar is the second in a series of online events that we've designed to fill the gap left by canceled in-person meetings our inaugural webinar um, was about protein science related to COVID-19. That was on June 4th, and that was a great success. Today's event is organized by past president Carol Post, and will feature talks drawn from the program of the canceled World Conference. And this webinar promises to be just as exciting as the one last month. Three upcoming webinars were designed and contributed by our members, and these will feature mechanisms of molecular chaperones, liquid-liquid phase separation, and cryo-EM using nanodisks. We have right now an open call for additional webinar topics, and Protein Society members are invited to submit a proposal to organize and host an event with our promotional and technical support, and instructions about how to apply can be found on our website. Um, you can find the link for that in the Zoom chat, and we'll be putting a num number of other useful links into the Zoom chat over the course of the event. Um, we're now deep into planning for our 2021 meeting, which will be held in Boston from July 6th to 10th next year. Our program planning committee is chaired by Jeannie Hardy with co-chair Gabe Lander, and they have a phenomenal lineup of topics and speakers planned. Of course, we don't know what the future will bring for in-person meetings a year from now, but we're very hopeful that we can convene together. And in any case, we're committed to providing exciting science and networking opportunities and mentoring for young scientists. Um, okay, I wanted to take a minute to say that the COVID-19 pandemic is not the only challenge that we're all facing that requires the talents and service of protein scientists. Recent events have reminded us again of the racial disparities that pervade our society and we in the Protein Society leadership want to take this opportunity to assert that black lives matter. And you can find our society statement about current events and racial inequality at our website. Um, science is not immune from racial disparities and 2020 is an important call to action for all of us. In that context, I wanted to introduce to those of you here today one specific Protein Society initiative. Our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee is chaired by past president Charlie Brooks. And last year, we launched the website diversifyproteinscience.org. And if you are a Black protein scientist or a member of any other underrepresented group, including a woman, uh, we encourage you to add yourself to the list at this website so that people who are organizing conferences and constituting committees can find you and access your talents and expertise. And over the coming weeks, we'll be planning our next set of initiatives at the Society focused on outreach, mentoring, and inclusion to support scientists of color. Okay, I have um, one final announcement, which is related to our Society journal, Protein Science. After 15 years of dedicated service, our editor-in-chief is stepping down. Brian Matthews has provided outstanding personalized leadership to the journal and to the Protein Society, but we're now seeking a new editor to carry on his work. And if you are interested in this position, or if you would like to nominate someone for this important role, 
more information is available on our website and you can also see the link for that in the chat. Okay, so for um, those of you in the audience who are not members of the Protein Society, Society, I encourage you to learn more about our organization. Please consider joining our community and helping us organize events such as today's webinar. And for those of you who are members, please vote today in the society election, which will close um, on Friday at the end of this week. Okay, and so with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Carol Post, who will explain the format of today's event and introduce our first speaker. Over to you, Carol. Thanks, Amy. Um, let me... See if I can now get my is that is that appearing correctly, Amy? I have to unmute. Um, Carol, we're seeing still your thumbnail sketches and your um, notes. So I think you want to do whatever trick you did before about um, switching displays, probably or or make sure you're in um, slide presenting. Uh, okay, uh, let's try that. Yeah. That didn't work? Mm, no. There's evidence to everybody that practice does not always make perfect. <laughs> We did How is that? Work. Yes, there you are. That's good. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> there are too many icons on the uh, share screen options. Okay, so uh, welcome any, everyone. Uh, you've heard uh, all about the Protein Society and I'm excited to be here and host this second webinar that's being presented free to um, all the registrants. It is the, uh, the topic of this is emerging topics in the evolution of protein science. And we have three very um, exciting speakers who are at the forefront in their fields, various uh, biophysical approaches to study proteins in, uh, in situ as well as uh, in vitro. So we're going to have uh, some talk, a talk by uh, Bob Griffin from MIT, uh, Tanya Mitag from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and Michael Feig from uh, MSU. So we have a broad range of topics here from uh, NMR, uh, liquid phase separations and uh, molecular dynamic simulations of a cellular environment. So quite a wide, wide variety. Um, before we get started, let me first uh, mention a few things about how we will uh, conduct the webinar. We will have um, questions and answers, and there's a box open, a Q&A box. Please submit your questions to that box. Don't submit questions to the chat box. We're going to reserve the chat box simply for technical support questions and any questions you wish to address to um, our hosts, the Protein Society or Amy or myself. Um, also, I would like to ask you to put the name of the speaker to whom the question is addressed. When we have three speakers, by the time we get to the end of all three talks, people will be asking questions to, um, you may ask questions to any of the three speakers, so it will be very helpful if you can put their name at the beginning of the question. Uh, also, I'm happy to say that the speakers, all three speakers, have agreed to have the, their talks recorded. So we will post these on the Protein Society website. You can see the URLs on the, on the uh, slide there. Uh, that will be there uh, from sometime soon after this webinar. Also, the speakers have all agreed to hang on for a little bit after the, the talks are over. And uh, I'm sure there will be more, many more questions than uh, we can answer verbally. 
There will be a few minutes at the end of each talk to answer questions verbally, but there will be more questions posed, I'm sure, than we can handle um, given the time allotted. But all three speakers have agreed to hang on and try to answer these questions um, in written uh, answers and the, through the Q&A box. Um, so with that, uh, I think we will now get started. And our first speaker for today is um, Bob Griffin, who is a resident at MIT. Bob uh, got his PhD at WashU in St. Louis, and he moved to the Francis Bitter Magnet Lab at MIT in 1972, and he's been a uh, professor in the Department of Chemistry since 1989 and at MIT. Bob is well known for his pioneering efforts in all kinds of uh, solid state NMR spectroscopy. Primarily, he has been recently um, uh, over, uh, concerned with dynamic nuclear polarization, DNP, this is a very up and coming approach that because of commercialization is now available to many laboratories across the world, not just labs like Bob who build their own spectrometers from scratch. So this is adding great uh, new potential to the use of solid state NMR uh, in many ways, uh, as exciting in the field of NMR as cryo is in the field of, uh, of uh, crystallization and cryomyth microscopy. So with um, that, let me hand it over to uh, Bob, who's going to give us a talk entitled Atomic Resolution Structures of Amyloid Fibrils, Magic Angle Spinning and Dynamic Nuclear Polarization in MR. Bob. Myself, all right, um, and share my screen here and present it. Okay, so does that give you, okay, you're seeing the proper screen. Okay, so thank you, Carol, very much for the introduction uh, and the invitation to present this talk today uh, <clears throat> to the Protein Society. And what I want to tell you about is are two or three topics. Um, first of all, how you determine a protein structure with magic angle spinning. And we'll focus on a topic that's very interesting and been a central, central topic of our research, and that's the A-beta 1 to 42 fibril. It's a toxic species in Alzheimer's disease, and that's shown here uh, in the center, uh, the center of the, uh, of the display. I'll go over how you determine uh, that structure with, her, for example, C13, C13 structural constraints and <clears throat> leading to the structure, and then how we can incorporate dynamic nuclear polarization into these experiments to increase the sensitivity. And that will involve adding polarizing agents, biradical polarizing agents like this, two nitroxides tethered together, and you shine microwaves on the sample, you induce electron nuclear polar uh, transitions. And that gives you enhanced NMR signals, factors of 200, 300, in principle up to a factor of about 660. Now the people who have done this work uh, are shown on this slide. Uh, Robert Silvers and Mike Colvin uh, did most of the work on A-beta 1 to 42 together, and more recently Kevin Donovan contributed to it. It's being carried on presently by Brian Michael and Salim Abrahe, two graduate students in the group. It's been a long-standing collaboration with Sarah Linza from Lund University, uh, who's made uh, some really significant contributions to sample preparations. Uh, Joe Wall at Brookhaven did some scanning tunnel and electron microscopy experiments with us for us. And we've had a collaboration with Guido and Anne, uh, as well as Joachim Strupa from Brucker on high-frequency magic angle spinning. So a very brief outline uh, that I can tell you about, is, uh, what I'll tell you about today is shown here. I'd first like to go over a little bit about amyloid for those people not into this field and Alzheimer's disease. And I'll talk a little bit about dialysis related amyloidosis, which is another amyloid project we've been doing with Sheena Radford. 
And then I'd go over uh, the, the, the steps that we uh, employed to determine the high resolution structure of 1 to 42, and then how we incorporate DNP into these magic angle experiments, and finally, a proton detected uh, mass on A beta 1 to 42. So these last two parts are really a completely new emerging techniques for protein structure and uh, <clears throat> stuff, protein structural studies. Okay, so amyloid fibrils. Now there are two basic types of amyloid fibrils. One's a pathogenic amyloid, uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease, A beta is an example of that. Uh, another example, which we work on, is dialysis-related amyloidosis, which is due to the beta-2 microglobulin amyloid deposits uh, that occur when your kidneys fail. Now, there's also, there's also another class of amyloid, functional amyloid. For example, uh, the amyloid shown here from SUP35, which are protective, or can be protective of cells, okay? Now, what's interesting uh, for us is that all of these are non-crystalline and they're basically insoluble. So classic structural techniques like X-ray diffraction uh, and solution in MR are really not applicable to these systems. And because they're insoluble, the magic angle spinning experiments for solid state NMR that I'll tell you about uh, are really a, a very nice approach to doing structural studies. So we'll be talking about things called dipole recoupling, where we introduce new uh, methods for measuring distances and torsion angles, as well as DNP. Now, <clears throat> there are lots of different diseases associated with amyloid. Uh, for example, Alzheimer's is the most well known. There are about 5.8 million Americans. Uh, with AD today, Parkinson's disease, about a million Americans have that, type 2 diabetes. And you go through a list of all the amyloid uh, clinical syndromes, and you'll find there are probably about 40, maybe 50 today, uh, different clinical syndromes associated with amyloid. And what this suggests, uh, a statement that Chris Dobson used to make, is that you can make any peptide or protein into an amyloid. Uh, and that's probably not quite true, but almost any peptide or protein can be in, uh, induced to form amyloid if you lower the pH and heat it a little bit, right? Now, the most famous of these, of course, is Alzheimer's disease. It was first diagnosed about 110 years ago, and uh, it results in cortex shrinkage, which damages areas involved in thinking, planning, and memory, and, of course, eventually leads uh, to death. Uh, <clears throat> it was first diagnosed by Alois Alzheimer's in Frankfurt, Germany about 1905 and 1906. And so for about 110 or 20 years now, uh, people have been trying to determine uh, the structures involved uh, in amyloid, the amyloid forms of Alzheimer's disease. All right. Uh, whoops. Yeah. Now, uh, today we have about 47, well, in 2015, we have about 47, we had about 47 million people. Uh, suffering from dementia uh, with amyloid. And if we project those numbers, the growth of the, the AD and the Alzheimer's disease, so 2050, uh, 30 years from now, we'll have probably maybe 132 million people. And we're currently spending about $305 billion on AD cases, the 5.8 cases I showed you, told you about today. And in 2050, uh, we'll probably have about 16 million cases and maybe be spending $1.1 so as terrible and as awful as this pandemic is that we're dealing with right now, the COVID-19 pandemic, we also have another very serious problem uh, percolating in the background uh, due to Alzheimer's. So it's very important uh, that people who study protein structures uh, determine the structures of these fibrils, how to deal with them, and perhaps how to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Now, <clears throat> amyloid uh, fibrils, uh, occur in many different different cases, but they all uh, have some characteristic features. One is they bind Congo red or thioflavin T. Uh, they give a cross beta structure and an X-ray powder diffraction pattern. Uh, <clears throat> and if you look in the cryo EM, they have these twisted fibrillar structures like I've, I've showed you right here. So it's basically a ribbon that's twisted. And as I mentioned already, they're insoluble. They do not diffract the high resolution. So they're great candidates to, to, uh, to study with magic angle spinning in MR. Now, what is magic angle spinning in MR? Let me just remind you of that. So you take a little rotor, uh, like I've shown right here, uh, four millimeters, three millimeters, 3.2 millimeters, uh, down to say 0.7 millimeters or so in diameter. You fill it with a sample and you spin it. You orient it at 54 degrees, 44 minutes with respect to the magnetic field and you spin it as fast as you can, 
and that averages a solid state NMR spectrum, which is a powder spectrum that looks like this, into sharp lines like you would obtain uh, if you had a liquid sample. Uh, so what we're trying to do then is simply increase the resolution by averaging chemical shift anisotropies and dipole couplings. Now the problem with this, if you want to do structures, is you, at, you attenuate the dipole Hamiltonian right here, and this has a 1 over R cubed dependence in it, which allows you to measure carbon-carbon, carbon-nitrogen, carbon-phosphorus distances uh, and to do structures. And we have to, to restore those dipole couplings with techniques called dipolar recoupling, right? But you can do all of that, <clears throat> and this shows you a typical spectrum that you can get these days uh, from A-beta 1 to 42, a sample prepared by Sarah Lenza, shown right here. This is a carbon-carbon spectrum. It's taken with a technique called radio frequency driven recoupling, which connects one bond to single bonds uh, to one another. So for example, if you look down here in this region of the spectrum, you will see the two serine C alpha C beta cross speech from serine A and serine 26. You see the isoleucine uh, C beta C alpha cross speech. So these are one bond cross speech, but this is a kind of spectrum now that you can get uh, reasonably routinely with magic angle spinning. So how do we do this? How do we take this and use it uh, to do the structure of A beta 1 to 42, which is a toxic species uh, in Alzheimer's disease, or at least thought to be that. So the first thing you have to do is prepare a good sample, and Sarah Linza has worked out a beautiful way to do that. Uh, she does a nickel affinity chromatograph, uh, chromatography to begin with, but A beta uh, and lots of other amyloids, they aggregate very quickly, so you get two species at least, all right? You get the red species, which is an aggregate, and the magenta species here with the monomer. And you use the size Sarah has worked out a way to use a size exclusion chromatograph uh, to separate the monomers uh, from these aggregates. And you fibrilize them, the monomers, and that gives you what we call, like to refer to as a monomer. Um, and then you centrifugally pack that into a magic angle rotor and you take an N15 spectrum. And if you see an amide backbone region that looks like grass right here a little bit, as well as the arginines and the lysines, it means you have a good sample. So the idea is to initiate the fibrilization of A beta 1 to 42 uh, with pure monomers. And that's been crucial to the advance of the experiments that I'll tell you about today. Now, once you've done that, uh, we need to do uh, assignments, as I mentioned before, and we use this particular pulse sequence. It's just called radio frequency driven coupling. And we measure distances with some version of a pulse sequence that looks like this. We call it proton assisted recoupling or PAR. Uh, we published this initially in uh, 2008 and more recently a refinement of it in 2017. So what I showed you previously uh, was this one bond carbon-carbon spectrum uh, from an RFDR experiment right here. And again, you can see the S8 and S26 cross peaks. And if they're single cross peaks down here, you have a monomer. If these cross peaks are doubled or quadrupled or so forth, then you have polymeric uh, material. So that's a, that's a very diagnostic region you can use to look at uh, A beta A beta samples. Now this allows you to do spectral assignments, which is the first step in doing a structural determination. But then when you turn on the technique subpar, that is setting up better par, uh, you get all of the intra and intermolecular cross peaks. So all of these extra cross peaks over in the spectrum here on the right are due to carbon-carbon distances which are not directly bonded from one another. So subpar provides uh, the distance information uh, that we need in order to do a structure. Now you can see that we get <clears throat> actually important information here. So if we blow up the top half of the spectrum, uh, you can see that there are cross peaks here, for example, from M35 and up to L17. There's another cross peak here from I41 to G29, a third cross peak from I41 to K28. And that tells you you're seeing amino acids uh, who are not adjacent to one another in the, in the peptide sequence and in the protein sequence uh, talking to one another. So those are through space couplings which are important uh, if you want to do structural determinations. Right? Now we also have to know if you're doing an amyloid structure, the mass per unit length, and you get that information from a scan length on the electron microscopy experiment, uh, which Joe Wall from Workhaven National Lab did for us. So you see on the left here, uh, the micrograph, and you see there are dimers in it. Um, there are tetramers in it as well, uh, shown in the blue over here. 
And then we also have the uh, standard, the T of Temecula mosaic virus standard. So our fibrils then um, consist of dimers and tetramers, and the tetramer is actually constructed of twisted dimers. So now that we know that we have a dimer as a sort of fundamental unit, we can look uh, to determine the intermolecular contact or the interface between the units. Now the way you do that is shown on this, this slide. So up in the top trace, we show a PAR spectrum from a 100% label sample, and we have a series of red and black cross peaks up here. Now the red ones you see are from M35 and Q15, M35, L17, M35, L34. And when you dilute that sample uh, with natural abundance material, say down to 30%, you see these red peaks all disappear. And that means they are intermolecular contacts in the A beta 1 to 42 dimer. And so that allows us to construct the dimer interface. And down here on the, on the bottom, you see the M35 side chain uh, intercalated down in between L17, Q15, and it's also talking to L34 on the other, <coughs> um, uh, which is located above it. So this is the way then a technique that you determine the intermolecular contacts in dimers or dimers, okay? So 30%, 30% sample, 10 of the cross peaks disappear. And then we measure a lot of internuclear distances. Um, <clears throat> we've measured over 500 non-trivial constraints. These show, this shows you the carbon-carbon distances that we've measured. We've also measured a lot of carbon-nitrogen distances and that allows us to do uh, the protein structure calculation uh, with Cyana or NIH Explorer, one of the one of the programs, right? And this yields yields then a high resolution structure, atomic resolution structure. We have more than 18 constraints per residue, and on an X-ray um, resolution uh, scale, it would lead lead to a 1.6x limb resolution structure. So this is indeed an atomic resolution structure of A beta 1 to 42. Now, what did we learn about that uh, that's interesting chemically and biophysically? Well, there are two or three things that we, we have time to talk about today. First, uh, David Eisenberg has talked a lot about hydrophobic steric zippers or steric zippers uh, uh, in connection with amyloid fibrils. And we see examples of uh, <clears throat> steric zippers in this particular structure. We see phenylalanine, isoleucine, alanine, uh, compacted into the center of the protein of, of the core that I've shown right here. Uh, <clears throat> so these are new steric zippers because they're not just the same, all the same kind of amino acid, but they're, they're hetero, hetero amino acids in there. We also see uh, the hydrophilic so-called toxic corner uh, where D23 and E22 are located. Now these are two amino acids which are, are um, mutated very often when you have early onset Alzheimer's. For example, uh, E22G is the Arctic mutant, uh, E22 delta is the Osaka mutant. So we, we've located the so-called toxic corner down here. Uh, when we go to one of these mutants, it will probably change the structure a little bit, uh, but that's where they showed up here. We also see a salt bridge now between uh, 42 and K20, A42 and K28. So once they have the structure then, it's a point of departure for designing drugs to interact with it and to control uh, fibro formation, all right? So again, it's a high resolution structure, 1.6 inches. And here you can see now the hydrophilic toxic corner where all the mutants uh, occur, as well as the hydrophobic uh, steric zippers, all right? Now, we can also uh, understand some other things. You, you can ask the question, is this dynamic tail uh, that we see. So we don't see the residues D1 up to about Q15 in the solid state in the Mars spectra. They're dynamic. And you can ask the question, does this have a function? Is this functional? The dynamic tail functional? And many people, you've probably heard that Biogen has this antibody, a Ucamumab, uh, which interacts uh, with A beta 1 to 42 fibrils and actually clears the plaque from AD patient's brain. Uh, <clears throat> and the question is, how does it actually work? Well, in the crystallography uh, experiment, in the fraction experiment, uh, uh, the Biogen people actually crystallized uh, the peptide E3 to B7 and showed it interacted with the antibody. So this dynamic tail that we see, D1 up to about Q15, actually is the mechanism, uh, we believe, in which this antibody binds to the fibrils and actually leads to their dissolution and the clearing up in the AD brains. Now, 
we were not the only people uh, to do this uh, structure at the time we published it. Our colleagues in Lyon and the ETH in Zurich uh, obtained a similar structure to what we did. Uh, the red structure here is shown uh, superimposed upon our blue structure. And we call this a delta S is less than zero experiment uh, because two of us actually got the same answer working independently, uh, slightly different methods to, uh, to prepare the fireballs and so forth. So we were quite happy uh, in the Alzheimer's business and the A beta business that two groups uh, come up with actually the same answer. Uh, this was a very exciting to David Eisenberg and he actually called this a milestone in biomedicine, primarily because people have been looking for this structure for about over 100 years. Now, how can we improve the techniques uh, that we use to determine the A-beta fibrils and other amyloid fibrils and membrane proteins and so forth? Well, the two ways to do it that are currently being developed right now are dynamic nuclear polarization and proton detected mass experiments. Now, in a dynamic polarization experiment, what you're doing is compensating for the relatively low signal noise at present in an NMR experiment. And this just shows you the polarization. In other words, the number spins up and down in an NMR experiment at say 700 megahertz and 90 Kelvin, which is a low temperature where you do DNP, and it's point, about 0.02%. So you look at this number and it's amazing that NMR actually works at all. But if you look at the polarization, for example, of an electron at this field and, and temperature, it's about 12%. So if we can transfer the polarization from the electrons uh, down to the nuclear spins, then we can enhance the sensitivity of NMR and you do that by radiating with high frequency microwaves and in principle you can get factors up to about 660 or so. So how do you make a sample for a DNP experiment? Well you take a membrane protein, maybe bacteria or dopsin, uh, those dependent anion channel or whatever, and you add to that uh, a biradical polarizing agent like this, something called totopol, it's two nitroxides tethered together. I can't, don't have time to explain why we use that, but that's probably the optimal system right now. Uh, this could also be an amyloid fibril, A beta 1 to 42, uh, uh, beta 2 microglobulin, and so forth. You cryoprotect it with glycerol, uh, <clears throat> and then you freeze the sample. And what we found is we put it in a special formula, DNP juice. So everybody in my lab gets up in the morning and has a DNP juice. Uh, that's a solution of D8 glycerol, D2, and H2O, and that optimizes then uh, the signal enhancement uh, that you get from a DNP experiment. So what happens then is you shine microwaves on the sample, and the polarization from the electron diffuses out to the protons, as I've shown right here, and then by other NMR techniques, you can transfer it to carbon, nitrogen, or whatever. So this just shows you an example of a DNP experiment. This is a very favorable one, the very best we've ever obtained in which we just take a urea sample, which is a standard. Uh, we polarized it with this biradical polarizing agent called angupol, and we get a factor of 420 for an enhancement. Now, what does that mean for NMR? Well, that means you can do in one day, if you have an enhancement of 400, that means you can do in one day an experiment that would take you otherwise 483 years. So as Carol mentioned before, this is like a synchrotron upgrade for NMR. Uh, so it's a huge enhancement in signal noise and sensitivity, and uh, these experiments are now uh, can be done on commercially available equipment uh, that, uh, that you can purchase. So we don't get, in the case of a beta, uh, a factor of 400, we get 22 uh, instead, uh, which is what you get in the realistic experiment, but that means in one day, uh, a one day experiment becomes a three minute experiment or one week experiment, a 20 minute experiment or so. And this just shows you an enhanced signal uh, from A beta 1 to 42. This is the microwaves off, and this is with the microwave on. Now, this was taken at a 40 kilohertz magic angle spinning rate uh, on an 800 megahertz spectrometer and 527 gigahertz. Right? Uh, <clears throat> and this is a sort of 2D spectrum you see uh, from this. It's just as well resolved as what we see at room temperature. For example, this isoleucine uh, 31, C alpha C beta cross peak here. Uh, is 0.6 ppm wide or so. Uh, <clears throat> and that's identical uh, to what you see uh, with a 300 Kelvin, so we have really excellent resolution. We have excellent resolution also in the NCO, NCA uh, uh, type spectra, which uh, uh, NMR people would be uh, quite interested in, right? Uh, 
Now, what do we learn uh, from DNP that we don't already know? Well, we get really good signal noise, and we can do a so-called NCOCX and NCACX uh, spectrum. And what that shows you is these sets of cross beams, which I've labeled in green here. And what those are are contacts between the glycine 33, the leucine 34, and the valine 36 that shows that these, these particular fibrils actually do stack up in a parallel and register manner. So that's something new that we've learned from DNP that we didn't know before. So again, we have excellent resolution. Now the final topic in the next minute or so is just to tell you about uh, 2D uh, magic angle spinning. Uh, <clears throat> now you can spin faster and faster as you make the rotor smaller and smaller. So everything I've told you about before was in a 3.2 millimeter rotor. And when we go to a 1.3, we can spin to 65 kilohertz or so, and you get sort of a proton carbon spectrum that looks like this. But when you crank up the spinning frequency to 100 kilohertz, that particular region of the spectrum really resolves itself. So we can get much better resolution because we're suppressing proton-proton dipole couplings, and the rotors are tiny, so you really only need about a half a mega of sample. And you get beautiful spectra, very well resolved uh, from A beta 1 to 42, as I've shown right here. And you can ask the question then, what can you learn from these experiments that again, we can't uh, do from, from our other experiments. And this just shows you one example uh, where we can do these multidimensional 3D NHH, CHH, and CCH spectra. And these provide long range proton-proton contacts that yield intramolecular structural constraints. Uh, for example, they're highlighted in red here. Uh, you can see, for example, G33. This is the primary cross peak talking to V36 and V36 gamma 1. That's right over here. Or you can see F20 talking to A30 and to I32, uh, as I've shown right here. Okay. So this is a this is a powerful new technique as well as DNP is a proton detected experiments at high spinning frequencies. And while we haven't done it yet, uh, our obvious goal then is to combine the DNP with the proton detection uh, <clears throat> experiments into one uh, experimental protocol. So in conclusion, uh, what I've tried to show you is that mass NMR is really an excellent approach to determining atomic resolution structures of amyloid fibrils. You can get very high resolution if you have enough data. Uh, you can increase the sensitivity enormously with dynamic nuclear polarization. So this is truly an emerging technique for protein structure determination. And finally, the proton detected experiments offers increased resolution. You have another dimension in your experiment and it provides a, a, a rich new source uh, of structural constraints. So again, let me thank my colleagues uh, who did all of this work and worked very hard. And I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, that was great. Um, <clears throat> So we've really gone quite a quite a long way in in solid state NMR, going from what I used to jokingly call blobology to some real <laughs> resolved spectra that actually look like now high resolution solution state NMR spectra. They do. They do. It's it's amazing. So um, let me uh, read to you some of the questions that are coming up here. Um, could you comment, please, on the differences in the two structures that were obtained by your group and the um, group in uh, the ATR? And Leo, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I can. And compare them to cryo EM structures. Well, um, okay. Um, let me go back to that. Um, so, so the, the structures we got uh, are really virtually identical to what was reported from, um, from Zurich and Lyon. Um, that's, uh, those are the two structures. They had actually uh, somewhat fewer structural constraints than we did. So the, the, um, the amino acid side chains that you see, for example, with the alanines, they really don't superimpose very well on one another. Uh, there's some, some differences down here. Uh, but we both see this uh, reverse mirror image S-shaped uh, backbone for the peptide backbone. So, I mean, within, 
the structural constraints that you have for both our, our data and the Leon and ETH data, uh, these are really identical structures. So what was the other part of the question, Carol? Uh, I compare them to the cryo-EM structure. Oh yeah, okay. So there's one cryo-EM structure um, that came out about a year after we published this. Um, and that's a completely different structure. And it turns out these two structures um, were actually uh, determined by uh, at pH, pH 7.8 phosphate buffer or so. And it turns out the cryo-EM structure, uh, if you look at it carefully, uh, it was actually determined in acetonitrile water mixtures, okay, 30% acetonitrile water at pH 2. Uh, that's another uh, set of set of conditions. I had that structure on a slide here to show you. This actually is different, uh, but it's a completely different pH and a completely different solvent system. So the structure is different. And what happens in that particular structure primarily is the tail, the dynamic tail, pulls around and uh, wraps up onto the side of the of the core. Okay. Okay. Um, Another question, uh, how would even higher NMR fields, say 1.2 gigahertz compared to 800 or whatever you were using, help with these solid state techniques? Well, they would be better, um, a lot better, a factor of one and a half better. And the uh, cost? <laughs> about, about three better when you do a 3D experiment. Um, <clears throat> So, so what's going on with the proton detected experiments, for example, as well as the DMP experiments, the proton detected experiments is a little clearer. When you go to higher magnetic field, that truncates proton-proton dipole couplings better, okay? It spreads out the chemical shifts more. And if you spin fast, you're going to get improved resolution, all right? Uh, so that's the secret. Uh, that's why it's essential. We don't want to do these at 300 or 400 or 500 megahertz. We want to do it, we want to work at 800. And it would be even better if we work at 1.2 gigahertz or higher. Okay, it's cost. It will cost a lot of money, as you well know. Uh, but the price is, as they make more and more of these things, will come down. And they will probably be operating in national and regional facilities. And the uh, you can actually do the, get the the DNP polarization that you need. At well, uh, the gyrotron. Yeah. Yeah, you can make a 790 gigahertz gyrotron. Um, they gyrotrons have been made up above a terahertz, uh, and so people are planning on 790 gigahertz gyrotrons right now uh, that will interface to a 1.2 gigahertz in the market. So you will see the DNP translated up to the higher fields uh, as soon as the fields become really available. Uh, let me just ask one more question uh, so that we don't get too far behind and then Bob, maybe you can answer the rest that are coming in um, in writing. Uh, a question on polymorphism. Are there any similarities or differences from the A-beta 1 to 42 structure of Nusenov or the various structures of A-beta 1 to 40? Well, A-beta 1 to 40, um, differs by an IA from one uh, in residue 41 and 42. And you wouldn't think that makes a big difference. But uh, the structure, we're, Salima Bahe and, and, and Brian and Michael are actually working on a 1 to 40 structure right now. And it's going to be different from one to, than it is to 1 to 42. So <clears throat> for example, it's known in biochemical experiments uh, that those two uh, types of molecules, those two fibrils do not co fibrilize They separate, right? Uh, so the structure is really, uh, it's going to be different than it is for one to, one to 40 is going to be different from one to 42. And then one quick uh, answer here before we move on. Uh, can the enhancement strategy you demonstrated transfer, uh, transferring electron polarization to protons and then to carbon be utilized in solution in MR? as well as solid state? Uh, th there are some approaches. They're called desolution DNP. Uh, and yes, it can be used uh, for solution in MR. It's used mostly for imaging experiments right now. Although quite recently, Lucio Friedman uh, has done some experiments where he's polarized water 
and watch it exchange into uh, the peptide, you know, to the backbone of uh, NH resonances in solution in MR. So there, there are techniques, emerging techniques, uh, to utilize DNP in solution in MR as well. I, sh I should mention that already, uh, with reference to the previous question, that Rob Tico has published a 1 to 40 spectrum, a 1 to 40 structure, uh, and it's different from what we see in 1 to 42. I should have said that in answer to the other question. It's a paper in cell. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Bob. Thank and <laughs> claps all around. So let's now move on to our second speaker, if I can try to share my screen now. Uh, You have the same situation you had before, Carol, with... Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I'm trying to remember. Uh, it comes up. I'm sorry. Uh, you can start the slideshow. Yeah, it says it started because, and I, 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 okay. It is accomplishing the basic task if you just want to. But are you, which, I don't even know which slide you're seeing though is what the problem. We see your whole PowerPoint with your slide and your four preview slides and your comments. And I'm trying to find out why I'm not getting any. Sorry. Carol, click on the uh, start slideshow button in the bottom. I've done that. And it doesn't work? It's, yeah, I'm not getting any reply. And I can't. From beginning, there's a button in the top from beginning. Char Charlie Brooks recommends unshare and reshare your screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> okay. Maybe. You could also start your presentation and then share. Oh, that's the same thing. How's that? No? That is the same. As it was before, but it's fine. I, you know. I think you can walk us through it, Carol. Right. Okay. <laughs> I am sorry, but this is uh, yeah, not okay. My apologies. Yeah, Carol, just just go for it. It's fine. We can. Okay. All right. So our second speaker is Tanya Mitag from St. Jude Children's Hospital. And I'm happy to uh, have Tanya here with us today. As Amy had mentioned, all of these speakers were originally to present uh, in Japan. So at least we get some, uh, some help, uh, some view of, of what we would have seen in Japan. So Tanya was a, a received her PhD at Johann Wolfgang Goethe at University in Frankfurt, Germany. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And in 2010, she moved to the Department of Structural Biology at St. Jude Children's Hospital, where she's been uh, moved up through the ranks from an assistant professor and is now an associate uh, member, sorry, associate member since 2016. Uh, she is very well known for her um, exciting work and uh, probing liquid-liquid phase separation as a means for functional compartmentalization in cells. And she's looking at the compartmentalization of uh, very interesting proteins, IDPs, and multi- uh, valent protein-protein interaction, so very dynamic processes. She's also interested in how these uh, phase transitions can uh, 
um, lead to disease processes when the phase transitions themselves become aberrant and dysfunctional. So with that, uh, Tanya, please do better than I did trying to share your screen. Thank you very much, Carol. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, and hopefully you will see my first slide now. Yes. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Carol, for the kind invitation and for giving me the opportunity to present a bit of my um, lab's work here today. So as Carol said, we're interested in understanding liquid-liquid phase separation and how that leads to the formation of these membraneless organelles that we see down here. We often reconstitute simple versions of them in vitro to understand the underlying interactions and then to study function and also disease processes. And I only will give a very short introduction to phase separation. We'll also hear a little bit more from Michael afterwards. Um, we think of uh, eukaryotic cells as highly compartmentalized and that that helps with functionality because it can segregate um, biomolecules in space and time. And um, in addition to all of these membrane bound compartments that we usually think of, there are a multitude of non membrane bound compartments. And we see one example here in the nucleus, the nucleolus. There are others, including nuclear speckles, but also in the cytoplasm, including pea bodies and stress granules. And there are dozens of others. And they are often spherical and even micro sized, micrometer sized structures and cells that can concentrate specific components without enclosure by a membrane. And these components can often enter and leave on second time scales, which shows that these are not large solid complexes, but very dynamic assemblies. And while they've been studied for decades, the big question was how are they being formed? And seminal work by Cliff Brangwen and Tony Hyman showed um, a bit more than 10 years ago that pea granules, which are an example of uh, membraneless organelles in uh, C. elegans embryos, that these pea granules can flow off nuclei and um, I need to make this small so that I can see my own slide. They can flow off nuclei and drip and often fuse into one larger drop. And there's this evocative video that, um, that shows this classic liquid behavior of these, of these pea granules. And they suggested already then that this coexistence of these two liquid phases, the pea granules and the cytoplasm, um, probably means that they are uh, formed by liquid-liquid phase separation. Liquid-liquid phase separation um, is now um, is, a, is a process in which um, macromolecules condense into dense liquid droplets that are then surrounded by a light phase at lower protein or lower macromolecule concentration. It's well known by crystallographers, but it's now um, um, become clear that this mechanism is used by cells to compartmentalize themselves. And it's um, understood as the underlying mechanism for the formation of mem membraneless organelles, although of course we realize that there are also other regulatory processes that contribute in addition to this equilibrium pro process to help in assembly, disassembly, and regulate the size of these droplets and cells. But two key pieces of information that show us that um, liquid-liquid phase separation underlies the formation of membraneless organelles is that the growth of some of these droplets and cells, for example, of nucleoli, can be dis well described by models for liquid-liquid phase separation, but there are not, not really other uh, good competing models. And that critical components of membraneless organelles um, can undergo liquid-liquid phase separation in vitro under close to physiological conditions. So what are um, the interactions that drive, or what's the molecular basis for phase separation? Um, Michael Rosen showed in seminal work um, in 2012 that the basis for phase separation um, of proteins and cells is um, multivalent interactions. And he studied uh, um, very typical systems where multiple SH3 domains are strung together by linkers in a natural protein. And this protein interacts with um, a binding partner that has multiple proline rich motifs that can interact each in interact with these SH3 domains. And this multivalent interaction leads to the formation of large non-covalently networked complexes that are not as soluble as the individual proteins and then undergo liquid-liquid phase separation. And these droplets then coexist with these networked complexes. And the higher the valence of the individual proteins, the lower is the concentration 
that one needs to um, see these uh, liquid droplets, then strong droplets emerging, emerging. So the higher the valence, the lower is the saturation concentration. So these domain motif types are well understood. But there are also disordered regions that can undergo liquid-liquid phase separation by themselves, by homotypic interactions without a binding partner. And intrinsically disordered proteins, regions of proteins are, of course, regions that don't um, adopt a stable, well-folded structure, but can interconvert between lots of different conformations and often are devoid of um, secondary structure and um, tertiary contacts. Um, how is phase behavior encoded in these intrinsically disordered low complexity domains? And can all IDRs undergo phase separation? This is something that one sees now in papers. There are, is an IDR, and that's why it must undergo phase separation. And one argument I will make to you is that IDRs um, encode phase separation very similar to these domain motif type systems. There must be multivalent interactions that are encoded within them by our um, um, adhesive motifs within them. And, um, uh, Rohit Papu has coined the word stickers for these motifs that can be just one residue long or longer, and they're connect connected by spacers. Um, so if we knew the identities of the stickers and the spacers in um, a disordered protein and their pairwise interaction strength, then we could also um, fully understand and predict phase behavior of, of IDRs. And so we wanted to tackle this question, and it was based on the idea that we wanted to um, determine wh what the stickers were in an unbiased manner. And to do that, we said the intermolecular interactions that drive phase separation must also be um, satisfied intramolecularly in, a single, in, in single proteins below the saturation concentration. To tackle this question, we needed a team of people. We teamed up with Rohit Papu's lab at Washington University in St. Louis and Alex Holhouse, who was a postdoc in his lab and now has his own lab, um, was the main driver on, on Rohit's side, and Mina Farag helped out. In my lab, Eric Martin and Ivan Perrin um, spearheaded the project, and Anna Bremer helped out with um, important tasks. And we decided to do this on the RNA binding protein HMRNPA1, which is a component of stress granules. We had previously shown that it can phase separate and that the low complexity domain, the intrinsically disordered low complexity domain, is sufficient for phase separation. It's called the low complexity domain because 86% of the sequence are made up of just six amino acid residues. Many of them are small polar, and then there are some aromatic residues sprinkled into the sequence and a few charged residues, but it's a very, um, um, it's, a, it's a sequence with very little charge. It's also called a polar prion-like domain. This, um, um, low complexity domain is intrinsically disordered, as we can see in an NMR spectrum here that shows very narrow chemical shift dispersion and sharp lines, which shows that there is averaging of, an, of the magnetic environment due to interconversion of all of these different conformations. And this protein doesn't contain any stably folded secondary structure. It's also very compact, as we can see um, from, from um, small angle x-ray scattering data. This is a normalized Kratky plot of small angle x-ray scattering data. And we've uh, determined a, a radius of gyration here and the scaling exponent of 0.45 says that this um, protein doesn't actually like to be solvated by the buffer very much. It actually likes to interact with itself. And when we take advantage of um, relaxation experiments, NMR relaxation experiments here, these are two relaxation experiments, then we can see these, this type of self-interaction. What we usually expect for a disordered protein is that um, a disordered protein without any structure is that we would have a plateau of all of the same R2 values here in the middle and then some tapering off to lower values at the side and the curvature of this um, Gaussian fit would be determined by the, um, by the persistent length of the chain. And when we fit this model to our data, we see that this is first of all a poor fit, but second also the persistence length is, um, has unphysically unph large values. But if we say, okay, there are these, in these clusters of enhanced relaxation rates on top of this Gaussian behavior, then we get physically reasonable persistence length. And we see that there are these clusters of residues that, are, that probably interact via their side chains. And the center of these clusters 
localize very well to the aromatic residues in the sequence. So this, these data are in, are in agreement with clustering of aromatic side chains. If we think there are interactions through space, then by NMR spectroscopy, we can look for nuclear overhauser effects or NOEs. There's a bit of a problem here because this protein has a very low chemical shift dispersion, as I said, due to its um, low sequence complexity. But we can take advantage of the fact that the phenylalanine and the tyrosine side chain resonances are distinct. And if we use a, an aromatic edited nosy spectrum, we sit here on the phenylalanine plane of, the, um, of this spectrum, then we see NOEs to the, to the tyrosine um, side chains. And if we sit on the tyrosine epsilon plane, then we see NOEs to the phenylalanine. So these aromatic side chains actually cluster in, in, in space. And um, we can make use of all atom simulations. Alex Holhaus here did Monte Carlo um, simulations with the absence implicit solvation model that Rohit Papu's lab has developed. And the, um, lots of the parameters are in very good agreement with experimental data, for example, the small angle X-ray scattering molecular form factor that we calculate from, um, from these ensembles. And so we can take advantage of these simulations to get more of an um, idea of what the conformational ensemble is really like. If we look at which residues have make a lot of context to other residues, then we see that most of these spikes here in this plot um, point to the aromatic residues in the chain. And in this network analysis, we can see that most of these aromatic residues can make contacts to all other arom or to a large number of all other aromatic residues. So we have distributive interactions of the aromatic side chains with side chains with each other. We wondered whether we saw these interactions because the chain was compact or whether um, the interactions actually drove the compaction of the chain. And so to test this, we changed the number of aromatic residues in the chain. We added one third um, in comparison to the wild type or removed one third or two thirds of the aromatic residues in the chain and did small angle x-ray scattering experiments again. And you see here again, a normalized Kratky plot. You see that with, inc uh, with decreased number of aromatic residues, the size goes up. So we see here in this rising plateau in this Kratky plot. So um, these aromatic residues give rise to the co cohesive interactions that de determine the chain dimensions and are truly the stickers in this sequence. So if they are the stickers, if we now know what the stickers are and we know that they compact the protein, then we, we thought we could um, determine the pairwise, um, their pairwise interaction strength from, from our experimental um, um, SACS data. And, and so um, Grohit's lab um, did that and parameterized the strength of the sticker-sticker, sticker-spacer, and spacer-spacer interactions for a lattice-based coarse-grained model that uses a single bead per residue, and we just have two types of beads, stickers at the position of the aromatic residues, and spacers that connect them. And that allowed them to put a lot of these chains into, um, into cubes and um, simulate phase separation of these chains. And we see that wild type phase separates really strongly. You see the formation of these droplets. This era minus variant that has one third fewer aromatic residues has a little bit less phase separation, a higher concentration of chains on the outside, and the era minus minus doesn't phase separate under these conditions at all. And we can do more. Um, the, um, we can uh, determine the volume fraction, which is basically the concentration of the molecules inside the droplets and outside. And if this is done as a function of temperature, then full phase diagrams of these variants can be determined. And you see that the higher the valence of stickers, the larger is the driving force for phase separation and the lower is the saturation concentration at a given temperature. And this is exactly equivalent to the um, domain motif type system that we understand so, so well. The valence of the stickers determines the saturation concentration of the system. Now, if we want to take this into um, actually the laboratory frame, let's say, because we have here a volume fraction instead of a molar concentration and simulation temperature instead of laboratory temperatures, we need to actually determine phase diagrams experimentally. And Ivan Perrin here in my lab um, did a lot of work to do this. You see here data for the wild type where he um, determines pairwise concentrations of the light and the dense phase that coexist. And then we also need data points up here close to the critical point at very high concentrations and temperatures, but due to the um, 
um, reversibility of phase separation in this very nice system, we can actually walk out of this phase diagram by raising the temperature here and then walk back in and see um, scattering and, and so we can determine these cloud points. These experimental data allow us to put the stickers and spacers simulation into this um, laboratory reference frame. And now we can compare this with um, experimental data for these other variants. And this parameterized model reproduces the experimental phase diagrams of all variants very well. And in addition, it gives us insight into why we never saw phase separation for this era minus minus variant. And that's because its critical point is actually below freezing. So can we transfer this model to other sequences or is it only valid for HNRNPA1? We use data from the literature on the low complexity domain of FUS, um, where data was available on the wild type version of, of this low complexity domain and, two, uh, and three other variants where one or two of these motifs were cut out and that reduced the number of aromatic residues in the sequence. They had reported cloud points at a given um, protein concentration and Alex did stickers and spacer simulations with our parameterized model and determined the cloud points from, um, from this model and they were, uh, that gave a, gave a very good correlation, which points to the fact that this pretty generic stickers and spacers model that only takes into account the number and positions of the aromatic residues here um, is able to be transferred to, to other sequences, um, prion-like um, polar low complexity domains. So the valence of stickers and their pairwise interaction strength determines the phase behavior of IDRs. But of course, we're also taking into account patterning via the coarse grain model. So we realized that the um, aromatic stickers were actually very uh, well linearly distributed in the sequence. And um, that if we had a random distribution of the aromatic residues in many, many sequences, then 99.9% .9 of these sequences would actually uh, would have less well randomly, less well uniformly distributed aromatic residues in the sequence. So that raised the question, what would happen if we distributed the aromatic residues in patches along the sequence. And when we did this, we saw that this variant, this patchy variant made amorphous aggregates instead of forming these nice liquid droplets that the wild type forms and also our per perfectly spaced control. So the increased linear clustering of stickers increases the apparent inter-sticker interaction strength, which leads to the formation of these amorphous aggregates rather than liquid. Um, droplets. And it shows the importance also of the spacers in diluting the interaction strengths of the stickers. And many IDRs um, avoid um, patchy um, distribution of aromatic residues and they're very uniformly um, distributed in the sequence. So brief conclusion to this part of the talk is we can identify stickers in low complexity dom domains in an unbiased manner from experiments on dilute samples, which is technically much easier than looking in dense phases. Aromatic residues in this RNA binding protein act as the stickers and they mediate distributive cohesive interactions. And when these aromatic stickers are linearly distributed in the sequence, then that promotes liquid-liquid phase separation and avoids aggregation. And the spacers are important not just to link the stickers, but also to dilute the interaction strength of stickers and promote salvation. And there are other sequences that may have other types of stickers, for example, aliphatic hydrophobic residues in elastin-like proteins. And we think that spacer types will also influence the phase behavior. And we're working in that direction. But so I, I've talked about an example where the patterning of low complexity domains makes their phase behavior nearly like that of, of homopolymers. And if we think back to proteins that have folded in disordered regions, then they can encode a multitude of valences, interaction strengths, phase diagrams, and material properties. And so I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of another system that we work on in the lab. And this is um, the tumor suppressor SPOP, which is a substrate adapter of an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And it recruits substrates to that ligase. And these substrates are then polyubiquitinated and degraded. And SPOP has a lot of interesting substrates, including hormone receptors and epigenetic regulators and anti-apoptosis anti regulators. And, and they need to be, um, their, their concentration in the cell needs to be controlled very precisely. And if they go too high, then that can lead to um, transformation of the cells and, and cancer. And indeed, SPOP is the most frequently mutated gene in prostate cancer and also mutated in other solid tumors. 
Now, why is this interesting in terms of phase separation? So SPOP um, stands for speckle type PUZ protein, and it gets its name from the fact that it's typically in nuclear speckles, but it can also be found under certain conditions in other punctate nuclear compartments, including polycomb bodies and DNA damaged foci. And the question is really how it goes around from um, one compartment to the other, probably driven by where substrate is popping up. So SPOP um, has three domains, a math domain, and we can see, see it twice in this dimer structure that binds to linear motifs in its substrates. A BTB domain through which it dimerizes, as you can see here in this dimer structure of this piece of SPOP, and a back domain through which it also dimerizes. And these two dimerization domains together lead to the formation of these higher order oligomers of SPOP that we have, and we've characterized their size distributions. And importantly now, um, this, uh, these higher order oligomers have multiple math domains that each of them can bind individual motifs in substrates and so are multivalent for a substrate. And we and others have also characterized that many of these substrates have, have multiple spot binding motifs in disordered regions. And now we have a, poly, um, a, a multivalent system on both sides. Why are spot substrate interactions split? between many very weak interactions rather than mediated by one strong interaction. This was one of the questions that we were interested in. And of course, we thought that this might have to do with phase separation also because um, SPOP goes to these um, nuclear bodies in the cell. And Joel Lotero and Jill Bouchard, when they were in my lab, tackled this question together. And Joel showed here that SPOP is in nuclear speckles by itself and DAX, one of its substrates, is in PML bodies. But if we um, transiently express them together, then they actually co-localize. And this is neither in nuclear speckles nor in PML bodies, and they form their, form their own nuclear body. And this suggested, of course, that they underwent phase separation together. And when Jill tested this in vitro with purified protein, this is here the C-terminus of DAX and full-length SPOP, or near-full-length SPOP, and she saw a liquid-liquid phase separation of them together, and um, both proteins are in these droplets. Um, this depends on the valence of both of these, um, both of these proteins, uh, the multivalence of both of these proteins. I'm only going to very briefly show you this. Um, we can make, take advantage of spot mutants that, that was disrupt one or both of the dimerization interfaces. Then we use them, lose the multivalence, and uh, we're losing phase separation of spot and DAX together. If we um, put these mutants in cells, then we see while the wild type nicely co-localizes with DAX, um, these spot mutants are now diffuse in the um, nucleoplasm and DAX is back in PML bodies. So the, uh, and I wanted to briefly um, say, and this also affects function while the wild type protein nicely wild type spot nicely poly ubiquitinates DAX, as we can see here in this black smear on this, on this Western blot. These mutants that don't properly co-localize with DAX have reduced um, ubiquitination activity towards, towards DAX. So multivalency of SPOP and DAX mediates their phase separation in vitro and in cells and seems to be important for their function. And we have lots of other data that I'm not going to go into that suggest that these SPOP substrate bodies are compartments that are active for ubiquitination. And SPOP that basically goes to compartments um, that contain substrates um, and their ability to phase separate um, helps them, helps SPOP to target its substrates. Um, if we look at the full phase, phase diagram of SPOP and DAX, then we see that they can't only form these dense liquid droplets that I've pointed out to you um, before, but they, they can also form at different molar ratios, these filamentous assemblies, and that DAX can even phase separate by itself at pretty high concentrations. And this raised the question where this interesting phase diagram is coming from. And um, our experimental work together with the um, analytical model that was developed by Jeremy Schmidt um, suggests this following, um, this following model where um, multivalent substrates, your multivalent DAX can bind to this multivalent spot oligomers and stabilize them and, um, and also cross-link them and that leads to the formation of these filamentous structures. But at increasing ratio of substrate to spot now, um, DAX doesn't bind across these oligomers anymore and, and to stabilize them, but it basically hangs off as brushes of these spot oligomers. And because DAX can phase separate by itself via its intrinsically disordered regions, 
we now get um, solubilization of these spot oligomers in a sea of these stacks molecules. And so you can imagine that you can um, encode lots of interesting phase behavior through the architecture of these multivalent proteins. I want to say quickly why we're interested in SPOP um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of cancer and how that's related to phase separation. So I mentioned SPOP is the most frequently mutated gene in prostate cancer. Um, the um, prostate cancer mutations are located um, directly in the binding site for, um, for the substrates here in the mass domain, as you can see here in magenta, and they reduce substrate binding affinity and that leads to enhanced substrate levels in cells. But we realized that they also impacted phase separation. So here we're keeping the spot concentration constant and just titrate the DAX concentration. And for wild type spot DAX interaction, we see that we go from this filamentous regime to the droplet regime at a certain concentration. But if we use these spot cancer mutants, then we need a higher substrate concentration. And for this variant, we for this uh, cancer mutant, we didn't reach the substrate concentration at all. So the saturation concentration for the substrate is increased. And um, um, we're, we're not reaching phase separation. And indeed, in cells, um, SPOP and DAX don't, um, while the wild type co localize together, um, the prostate cancer mutants of SPOP don't co localize with DAX. So we think in this case here, phase separation is, um, is not working properly due to the cancer mutations. Okay, so different protein architectures can encode multivalency for phase separation. We have these linear um, multivalent proteins where multiple binding domains are strung together. We have the case of SPOP where we have two dimerization domains that make together these higher order oligomers that can be multivalent for other proteins. This is a cartoon of NPM1 where we have an oligomerization domain um, that makes um, distinct size oligomers and then presents other binding domains hanging off of them. We can have stickers in um, IDRs that make the IDRs multivalent for itself. We can also increase this valence in IDRs by having, for example, a coiled coil domain within it um, as in TDP43. And I think I'm out of time and I'm gonna skip my last two slides and I'm just gonna say that valence and patterning of stickers determine phase behavior of biomacromolecules in IDRs, in domain motif systems, and we should even think about it that way in folded proteins that can undergo phase separation. And um, I'll leave you with an idea that would have been on my two slides to say, of course, you can also control conformational changes, for example, by post-translational modification, and that can reveal or, uh, or um, hide um, interaction motifs in proteins, and that can, add an additional level of control to liquid-liquid phase separation. And with that, I um, thank people who did the work. I tried to point them out as I went along. Um, so an important collaboration with Rohit Papu and Paul Taylor, who I didn't mention. And then the, on the side of SPOP, we've collaborated with Brenda Schulman, and it's been a longstanding collaboration with Stacey Ogden. And I acknowledge funding, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, Tanya, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, several questions here. I'm just going to try to pick a few. And Amy, if you see something you would like to uh, um, address, that's fine too. But let me, so Tanya, you're gonna be busy writing some answers if you don't mind. Um, so uh, to begin, for a given protein sequence, is it possible to predict whether the protein can undergo LPS just based on the sequence alone? Yeah, so Maybe that far. <laughs> yes, so I, I think it's still difficult, but we are on the way there, right? So if if I would, you know, I do this regularly when I sit in a seminar and somebody looks at it, shows me a protein, right? I look at the sequence, I try to decide for myself, is this protein going to phase separate or not? Often you need more information, you need information on the binding partners, what else is in the interaction network, and then look at whether there might be multivalent interactions between pairs of proteins or larger networks within them. If we think about intrinsically disordered proteins, then um, we know some rules, for example, these aromatic stickers, we're looking at other types of stickers at the moment as well. So um, the, uh, the stickers and spacers model uh, and, and, and um, PIMS, this is the, um, the, the, the motor which, which does the uh, simulations are available. 
uh, it's linked through our, our paper uh, where we describe this. Um, this is an incomplete model. I don't think it will capture everything, a uh, phase separation of all flavors of IDRs, but I think in the next few years, we'll see an explosion of these methods and of the experimental data that is really required to train these, these models, and then we'll be able to do that. So to, along these lines, a few of the other questions we're asking, uh, for example, what about electrostatic um, charged residues? Mm -hmm. And maybe you mentioned it at the end of your talk, but what do we know about phosphorylation perhaps of the tyrosines and how that might affect the exactly. behavior? So um, charged residues are an interesting case. We know, for example, from you know, polymer physics that oppositely charged polymers can undergo complex coarsivation with each other, which is a form of, of phase separation. We don't really know exactly all of the rules under which conditions they can or whether they just form high affinity complexes, because there are also examples of highly oppositely charged um, intrinsically disordered proteins that make high affinity individual complexes. So these rules, again, need to be um, figured out a little bit. Right now, we are looking at um, variants of this HNRNPA1 LCD where we titrate the charged residues and we're seeing some very interesting um, effects. Um, it's going back to the question whether arginines might be stickers as well. And yes, we think they are stickers to some extent but it's a very um, context dependent question because they also um, act as, spa as spacers in a way that they like to promote solvation because they are charged. All charged residues basically promote solvation and therefore reduce the driving force for phase separation. But if the net charge in the protein is right, then arginines can also contribute as stickers through um, interactions with aromatic residues. And so it's a very context dependent question. You have to look at the at the whole protein sequence to know whether there is a strong driving force from arginines or not, for example. Phosphorylation are a great example of how um, nature can control phase separation. Um, it can change the so completely the solvation properties of the protein. And depending on what the net charge in the protein will be, it can change towards more phase separation or less phase separation. And I think these are all important questions. All sorts of post-translational modifications will have strong in, um, impacts on phase separation. And we're chugging away at these questions, and other people do as well. And we'll understand that in more detail very soon, I think. Uh, I think maybe one question. Did you want to pick one, Anne? <laughs> oh, I can there just... are lots of good ones here. Yeah. So. So one attendee notes that the fact that you see NOEs is very surprising and asks about the time scale of that interaction and whether you've done control experiments with some of the aromatic mutants. Yeah, so um, control experiments with the aromatic mutants. So I, I don't, we have not done control experiments, for example, with the arrow minus minus that has only one third of the aromatic residues, but we have done control experiments with variants that has, uh, uh, there, there are two aromatic residues that are very close in the sequence and we were a little bit worried whether, um, or we wanted to make sure that our NOEs weren't just from these two closely spaced aromatic residues. So we um, did an, um, a nosy experiment on the perfectly spaced variant that I showed in the end where we're changing the patterning. So they're all um, nicely spaced. There are no two that are close in the sequence and we see the same NOEs. Also, I didn't show this data. We've done these nosy experiments as a function of temperature. We see this very nice effect that if we go to lower temperature, so more in the direction of phase separation, then we see stronger NOEs. So this is in agreement with there being um, um, either more long-lived or more frequent interactions of aromatic residues that um, lead to, the, to, these no, to these NOEs that we see. Okay. Thanks very much, Tanya. Thank you, Carol. So now we'll move to our third speaker and let me, yes, <laughs> pause. Uh, let me also remind the uh, attendees to uh, put your, your questions, pose your questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen and not the chat box. And also now that we're moving on to please um, indicate which speaker, you're certainly free to go back and ask questions of any of the speakers as we move along, but um, to, to help out, please put the name of the speaker at the beginning of the question. Okay, so our next 
talk. Should I even try to share my screen? <laughs> I will try once. And that's fine, Carol. Just can you see it? Does it work? Yeah, it's okay. It was before, but it's fine. Perfect. Just yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Amy. Um, so this is uh, our next speaker is Michael Feig. He's got his PhD at the University of Houston, and from there he did a postdoctoral study at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. He's now a professor. He began at the Michigan State University and has moved up from assistant to now being professor. And uh, his areas of expertise are primarily computer simulation, molecular dynamic simulations, and he applies these to proteins and nucleic acid solutions. Uh, he has really uh, uh, catapulted the field by being brave enough to simulate uh, a whole cell environment now by molecular dynamic simulations. Um, I think you'll hear about this, but this was uh, kind of uh, exemplary of Michael's uh, braveness and uh, he's not afraid of anything as I know personally. So he um, has learned a lot about crowding effects and how uh, this results in phase behavior. Maybe it's a good uh, um, follow-up from Tanya's talk about IDPs and phase separations. And he's also looking at uh, developing methods for high-resolution modeling of proteins and bacteria nucleoids. Um, also, um, just a kudos to Michael. I just heard that he was a very new recipient of the Outstanding Faculty Award at um, MSU. So congratulations, Michael. So with that, uh, please take over. All right. I'm assuming this is working for everybody. Yeah, thanks, Carol, for the great introduction. Thank you for the Protein Society for the chance to speak here. Thank you, everybody out there in the world for listening and uh, um, staying with us and um, hearing about protein science. So my my perspective is um, from a computational theoretical side and the, the advantage, so you heard a little bit from Carol, the advantage is that we can in principle look at things in molecular detail, very much so, and actually all the way to the atomistic detail, um, and uh, look at um, dynamics um, of basically everything that's going on in the cell uh, within, with a limitation that is in the computer and that we're not necessarily sure that it's for real. But I will show some experiments at the end too to convince you that some of the things that we're studying are actually happening. Um, so this is a simulation that Carol mentioned. This is um, um, a model of a, of a cytoplasm of a bacterial cell, Mycoplasma genitalium. We, uh, we didn't quite get to the full cell yet. That's still a future work, but we're moving in that direction. And so what you can see from this is basically the incredible amount of crowding in the cell. Um, th 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 these are proteins that you see here that are not necessarily interacting functionally, but because it's so crowded, they have no choice but to interact. You also see some metabolites in there that are in, in, in the way. And so basically the, um, the message from this, from, this, from this model, from the simulation is, is, is that there are all these sort of inadvertent interactions between the different bi biomolecules. And the, and the question then is how does that affect their physical behavior and ultimately their function? And I'm gonna talk about um, initially some, some sort of clustering, and then eventually I'll get to, to phase separation as well and, and follow up on Tanya's talk. Um, so, all right, so let's move along here. So one of the conclusions sort of maybe that's, that's intuitively obvious is that if you have a very crowded environment, uh, this is from, from same simulation, just a different view, your diffusion is going to be much slower just because there isn't so much space to move around. Right. And so that already was published a number of years ago. And again, this is maybe kind of obvious. What is, what is interesting though is, is that the, 
the degree to which diffusion is slowed down very much depends on the local environment of a given protein. So if we, from the simulation I showed you, if you now look at individual proteins and you look at their diffusion rate, it can vary quite significantly actually. And that essentially um, the variance comes from how many interactions they have with the environment. Um, so the basic idea is that if you have a local environment that, is, that has a little bit more space, a little bit more distancing, um, then you can move more freely if, if it's very crowded, um, not recommended these days, nevertheless, um, then you, can, um, you, you cannot move as much and your, your diffusion will be slower. Right? And so to understand this a little bit better, we went to a um, much simpler system. Um, I hope you can see the videos well, wherever you are. Uh, this is a simulation of, of a very small protein, chicken villain headpiece. So this is a switch and bait, go from the very large scale to a very small scale. Um, the reason why we looked at the small, the small system, the small protein, is that we could study um, very long, much longer time scale. So this, these are simulations over uh, two microseconds uh, that we could run in GPU computers, and um, we see that the the that villain, which is not supposed to form any kind of oligomers, dimers, trimers, anything like that, um, is actually associating on nanosecond time scales um, and uh, in a very dynamic fashion. So there's this cluster, this transient cluster formation. Um, Martin Grubula, I think, called this uh, quinary uh, structure um, that is on average leading to a villain to be associated with another villain and that then in return leads to um, reduced diffusion. So the, 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 actually if you take snapshots at any given time point here, you can find clusters that might be actually quite large like this one right here, which is um, I guess 20, 30 subunits. Um, but th the key point is that these clusters are very transient. So the time scales on, on which protein contacts persist between villain, different villain molecules is on the order of um, the different time scales actually, but the longest one is on the order of 100 nanoseconds, right? So the idea is really that these molecules come together and on and off, on and off in a very, very dynamic fashion. And on average, you have this, you have this, this cluster size distribution, but then if you look at any, any individual molecule, they're really gonna be interacting only for, for a relatively short time. However, because these clusters are formed, um, the diffusion slows down. And you can sort of look at this theoretically by, um, by taking this cluster size distribution that is extracted from the simulations and convoluting that with estimated slowdown in, in, in diffusion, translational, rotational um, as a function of cluster size and um, basically apply this equation here um, with the repetition solve show a couple equations along the slides. And then you can compare this sort of theoretically estimated slowdown and diffusion as a result of clustering with the actually um, observed uh, slowdown and diffusion from the MD simulations and they match very closely as you can see here, right? So it is basically the, the explanation of why diffusion is slower in these crowded cell environments is essentially because of clustering. That's, that's the idea here. Um, and so to maybe sort of drive this point home a little bit more clearly. Here is a movie of one of the simulations where just the center of the villain is shown. You saw before this, this black guy here was associated with these orange villains. Now it's moving around freely. It's diffusing much faster because it's, it's moving as a monomer. And then it will associate, there you go, it will associate with these purple villains and move slower again. So that's the idea that this is dynamic equilibrium where molecules, um, when they're associated, transiently with other molecules will diffuse slower and when they're free they move faster. Okay. All right, so this is sort of the American idea. Um, right, so proteins go around and dance and interact with each other. Um, so then, all right, so that's fine. So you have this sort of transient cluster formation and if you go to the physics literature, um, that is well known in the, in the college field and then the college field has phase diagrams like these where you have um, sort of a fluid phase where there's little interaction, then you have a clustering with certain sizes, but you're not really undergoing a phase transition yet. And then if you increase the concentration further, you might form something like a gel phase or some kind of solid phase. It could be crystal or it could be amorphous solid, the kind of things that Tanya was showing. What is missing though, and this is coming back to what Tanya showed, is liquid-liquid phase separation. So you can also have phase separation, particularly in biology, 
where you have different phases um, with different compositions um, while still remaining fully liquid. And so that's why is that important? So it's important for biology to have to be able to retain dynamics. Otherwise, it's difficult to have biological function. Right? So the so the liquid liquid part is 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 key to for the biological relevance. Um, all right. So now, what can we say about that? So if we run simulations of our uh, protein mixtures of protein mixtures concentrated protein solutions, uh, maybe at higher concentrations than um, um, what I showed before for the villain, which is still soluble. You see this this sort of condensation behavior, and you still see quite a bit of dynamics here. They they exchange partners, but this is probably going towards something that's more like a gel phase. So this is a a concentration, a mixture of concentrated villain, protein G, and ubiquitin at about 30% volume fraction. And this looks like we might be um, surpassing the solubility limit here. And then you can analyze this a little bit more, a little more um, quantitatively, and you can basically um, attract the, the, the percentage at which we're observing different cluster sizes, right? Before I showed you this for villain, that was essentially a decaying uh, distribution. This is now on a log log scale. Uh, and this, this is what you would see for this mixture also at 5%, 10%. But at 30%, you see this, this um, a different distribution where you have um, some amount of, of monomers. So one would be the monomer, dimers, trimers. But you see actually the majority in a very large cluster. And that is, that is a signature of um, um, basically, forming, basically forming a phase separated state. And, um, then you can argue whether this is still liquid or whether it's a amorphous solid or what it is, but that's that's sort of the hallmark. This kind of cluster size distribution is a hallmark of phase separation. All right, um, these are simulations actually that are now we're now able to extend to ten microseconds thanks to Anton Tu, a special purpose computer at Pittsburgh. Um, all right, but these are these are still fully optimistic simulations, but that is basically the limit of what we can reach. So we. We can go either very large scale and then uh, simulate on the order of um, maybe one microsecond today, or we can go to intermediate scale and atomistic detail and go to um, maybe 10 microseconds, maybe 20 microseconds. Um, that's not really enough to study liquid liquid phase separation and droplets, the kind of things that Tanya showed. And so, in able to get to that, we have to. Um, use multi-scale methods, in particular to coarse graining. And we actually, we did very radical coarse graining here. Uh, Tanya showed some results of these spacer and sticker models. We're, we're doing things even more radically. Uh, and we're gonna just simply say, okay, a protein, most proteins are mostly spherical. We're just gonna approximate it with a sphere. And the sphere has a, has a radius and the sphere has some kind of charge, which is the, the total charge, the net charge of the protein, and that's basically and then we have a simple potential that's, that's um, motivated by, by previous work from, from the colloid physics, colloid field that has a short range attraction potential that's essentially modeling um, solvation effects. And then um, you have long range potential that is including essentially the electrostatic effects. So if you have oppositely charged proteins, they will attract each other. If you have um, same charge proteins, they'll repel. And that's, that's basically folded into this, this uh, long range part here. And it's essentially like a deep uh, potential with a screening factor uh, kappa here. All right, so, um, so then our very complicated system that I showed you before, it then looks much, much simpler because we just have a single sphere for, for protein. And we can then, so why do we want to do this? Well, we can run simulations much, much, much longer as so we can easily run milliseconds. Um, on, we don't even have to use special purpose hardware, we can use GPUs for that. And we, even although this potential is very, very simple, we can actually recapitulate what we're seeing in the atomistic um, potentials after some tuning of the constants here. And we get similar kind of cluster size distributions of what I showed you before. And we can also reproduce the, the, um, the dependence on the, on the concentration here. All right, so um, this, this work, everything I'm showing from now on, this is um, in bioarchive, it's still pending review. I guess review is slow these days. Um, so if you want to read this, read about this, you have to go to bioarchive. All right, so now we have this nice coarse grain model. We can go back to our bacterial cytoplasm and see if we can now simulate this, this very large system 
over longer time scales. Um, and so again, it's a simple spherical model and not just every protein is a sphere, but every complex is a sphere. So this ribosome with all its complexity reduces to a single sphere with a, with a single charge and a single radius. Right? And so we have in this system here, we have some ribosomes are shown in magenta, tRNA. We're gonna talk about this in more detail. Positive proteins, positively charged proteins. I'm also gonna talk about these ProEL. Um, shown here is, is um, these um, pink, light pink spheres, and then all the other proteins are basically shown according to their charge. So you have different sizes and different, slightly more blue will be more positively charged, slightly more red, pinkish will be more red charged. All right, so we ran a simulation of this, and this is what we found. So this is after a millisecond, we see phase separation. And uh, what we see is, that was a little bit surprising, what we see is, um, that the, the RNA in orange here, that, so tRNA, um, associates with positively charged proteins. Um, so that suggests an electrostatic mechanism. Um, and then the ribosomes also do that, but they form separate clusters. So the ribosomes form uh, clusters with, also with positively charged proteins. And there's a difference if you look at this more carefully. The, the tRNA prefers the larger uh, proteins with a higher charge. And the, uh, the, the ribosomes actually prefer the smaller positively charged proteins with a lower charge. And this, uh, essentially, the way to understand that is it has to do with the packing and um, the size differences. It's better to pack large particles with small particles than to pack uh, same size particles. Right? So that's essentially the, the answer. All right, so this is a little bit surprising. So um, how can we understand this better? Well, one question is, does this, how does this change with scales? So since we have a coarse plane model, we can not just go to longer time scales, we can also go to larger scales and we're able to go to uh, 200 nanometers, even 300 nanometers, which is almost the scale of a, of a, of a cell now. Um, and we continue to see these, these uh, phase separated states and um, they grow in size. So that very much suggests um, a classic phase separation phenomenon. Um, all right, so, um, first question then to look at is, are we still talking about liquid sep phase separated states or are these now solids of some sort? Well, they, at least at the coarse grain simulation level, they do appear to be liquids. They're, um, the ribosomes don't move, move, move as much and that's just simply because they're large and heavy, but there is essentially, we still retain the liquid character. Okay, all right, so, so that's interesting. Um, you notice compared to Tanya's talk that there is, I'm not talking about any IDPs, I'm not talking about any multivalency, I'm not talking about any patches. So we are just simple spheres with different charges. Um, all right, so to understand this in more detail, we then reduce the system, the very complex cytoplasmic system to a five component model system, um, which with what we think are the essential components. So the ribosomes again, RNA and RNA component, we have a small positive protein, since there is a preference for ribosomes to interact with one type of protein versus the tRNA, a large positive protein, which is preferred by the, by the RNA, and then uh, crowders, um, which are shown in gray. So the feature, the crowders are featured by having no charge. So that's the idea. Um, and then we, uh, with this model system, we could run um, additional simulations where we systematically vary the concentration of, of the proteins, concentration of the ribosome, concentration of crowders as well to see what effect that has on the ability to phase separate. And so here's uh, sort of one of the, one of these phase diagrams where we plot the degree of phase separation as a function of uh, concentration of the, the positively charged proteins and its concentration of ribosomes. How do we measure phase separation? Essentially as a percentage of RNA that's found in the largest cluster. So we always have this kind of clustering that I showed in the beginning, but um, phase separation really means that there's one large cluster that contains, or multiple large clusters that contain most of the, 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 um, the molecules of interest, in this case RNA. Um, and so if you just use sort of an arbitrary criteria and say that if more than 50% are in the largest cluster, then this dashed line indicates the uh, division between the dilute phase without phase separation and the phase separate state. And there is, it requires a certain concentration, um, minimum concentration of the positively charged protein before phase separation sets in. Um, and then the ribosomes also seem to have an effect. And this, we looked at this a little bit more detail by, um, 
generating phase, phase diagrams as a function of temperature. This also is to prove that we in fact are looking at phase separation here. Um, and and um, there, um, so the role of the ribosomes differs a little bit depending on whether you're looking at low concentration of positively charged proteins or high concentration. So at the low concentration, the um, increase in the ribosome concentration leads to a slight reduction in the critical temperature. Um, so phase separation becomes less likely. You can also see this from this plot here. Um, and the, re the explanation for that is, is that the ribosomes actually compete with the RNA for the positively charged proteins because they're also phase separating. And so they, the, the ribosomes do prefer the smaller positively charged proteins, but there, if there aren't enough proteins available to compensate the charge, then they will also draw the, the larger proteins, the higher charged proteins from the RNA clusters, and that makes it more difficult for the RNA to phase separate. And then when the, when the concentration of the positively charged proteins is very large, um, 880 micromolar, we see initially an opposite effect, and then at the very high concentration reverses. This is also shown here. So initially the, the critical temperature goes up and then it drops. And the, the explanation for that is, is that at, there's, if there's a high concentration of positively charged proteins, then initially there's no competition for the positively charged proteins, but the ribosomes, as they're forming these condensates, act sort of as a, um, they provide an environment in the cell that then focuses so the X sort of has a lens to focus the tRNA to condense rather than diffusing freely be because of electrostatic propulsion. So this is our interpretation for seeing this opposite trend into higher concentration. All right, so um, now let's move on to its even simpler system, right? So the basic idea that you got from what I showed you so far is that apparently RNA and proteins can phase separate, can form condensates, um, essentially just based on electrostatics, based on charge. So we wanted to, to look at that further and also uh, we wanted to move towards um, hypotheses that, are, that can be tested experimentally more easily. Uh, and so we, we looked at mixtures of RNA and proteins and now involving in, um, RNA that we then also studied um, experimentally. I'll show you in, in a second what the structure looks like with, a, with 47 nucleotides. And we looked at proteins that are readily available. Right? And so uh, trypsin, alcohol dehydrogenase, ADH, lysozyme, uh, lactate dehydrogenase, cytochrome C, and myoglobin, they're all positively charged. They have different charges, different sizes. Myoglobin is, is, is small with a small charge. Um, um, ADH is relatively large, for example, with a moderate charge. So we have a good variation here of charge and size. And then as a control, we also looked at BSA, bovin serum albumin, which has a negative charge and uh, is also relatively large. And so, so if we um, now simulate these mixtures of RNA and proteins, we find, um, if, so this, there's a question now, what, what uh, value of, of kappa, the dipahirkel screening term we choose, um, we find a difference if we use this 0.7 term, um, uh, 0.7 value of kappa um, for the proteins that have a higher ch charge and or are larger, they are more likely to form phase separated states versus proteins that are either very small or that have a smaller charge or they're negative like BSA. So why do we see at the kappa value of 0.5, why do we see the phase separated states? Well, the answer is simply that because we have, we have um, the attractive term balanced by the screen debarical term, if we have too much screening, um, then so the, the 0.5 is the screening term, right? We have too much screening, too much screening of, this, of the electrostatic interactions, then basically it doesn't matter what the charges are and all we're gonna see is the attractive term. Um, all right, just, just as a reference to uh, compare with experimental observables, we think that copper term of 0.5 may correspond to something like 40 millimolar excess sodium chloride, 0.7 might correspond to about 20 millimolar excess sodium chloride. That's not what you would measure in experiment directly because uh, there would be additional salt required to, um, to act as chondrines um, since these are, um, this way of charged RNA and we have charged proteins um, and they're taken into account by essentially screening the charges by reducing the effective charges in our course group model. All right, so the prediction basically is that that should depend on the protein whether we're gonna see phase separation or not. 
Um, we then further developed a theory, essentially, um, based on a um, simple idea that you can estimate the chemical potential um, for, for proteins and RNA in the condensed or dilute phases by adding up enthalpy and um, the minus temperature uh, entropy term, uh, so classic free energy approach. And the uh, enthalpy here we um, estimated from um, integrating the, the potential that we used, the coarse grain potential over the over um, radial distribution function extracted from the simulations. Um, and the entropy is simply the difference, um, the ratio from the ratio of the uh, densities in the, um, the um, of entire concentration and the uh, uh, dilute or the condensed phases. All right, so if you want to see the details about that, um, you can go to the bioarchive paper. And then we, we essentially solve um, the free energies that we calculate in this way. Uh, we solve um, for the free energy of the condensed phase being uh, being equal to the dilute phase because that's a, that's a condition for phase coexistence. And then the solutions that you get are now shown in these in these uh, graphs here. And you find that um, there is there is a certain regime of uh, protein charge and protein radius that leads to condensation according to the theory. Um, on the left is shown the um, concentration of the RNA and the dilute and the, the condensed phases. On the right, um, the results are shown for the proteins. And you can see there's actually quite a bit of variation um, as a function of radius and charge. So you might, when you go to a large, a high charge and a high radius, large radius of the protein, you find that the RNA uh, will prefer to go to the condensate. So the RNA concentration is very low in the condensate here. When you have smaller uh, charge and smaller radius, there is, there's gonna be some concentration in the, um, in the dilute phase. And you can see similar, a similar effect here in the coarse grain simulations, right? When you look at ADH, there's almost no RNA in, in the dilute phase. For lysozyme, there's significant amount of um, of RNA in the loop trace. And the reason it's based on the theory is essentially that the size of lysozyme is much smaller. And so if you add, every, if you add the entire free energy uh, contributions together, then it's more favorable to have some amount of the RNA to remain in the loop trace. All right, so the prediction from the theory is, is that most proteins, so we're mapping again uh, the proteins that I showed before onto this, onto this diagram, most proteins should exhibit phase separation, but very small proteins with a low charge like myoglobin should not. All right, so now this is still all theory. Questions, can we see this experimentally? And the answer is yes. And so we studied, we studied um, um, this 47 mer RNA that I mentioned before. The reason why we picked this RNA is because it's roughly globular, not exactly, but this is as close as globular as it gets for RNA. And then we um, uh, mixed the RNA at uh, significantly high concentrations with significantly high concentrations of proteins, and we see phase separation for trypsin ADH lysozyme, also for LDH, but not for myoglobin and not for BSA. So we predicted that we wouldn't see it for myoglobin, BSA is the control with a negative charge. So that is very much encouraging. Um, uh, we also, from the theory, we also predict that there's a concentration dependence. Um, again, these are results from the theory showing, showing um, the phase separation as a function of total RNA concentration, total protein concentration. And there's a, there's a range here at very low uh, protein concentration where the theory predicts that we shouldn't see phase condensation. And in fact, the experiment confirms that. So we see, uh, we don't see anything when we have low concentration of protein only. This is not shown for trypsin. If we increase the concentration, we're starting to see this liquid droplets again. Um, I hope you're still with us. Um, there is help if you are suffering from Zoom fatigue. But I want to uh, conclude the talk um, that um, basically the message is from the simulations is that there is there are these transient interactions that are unavoidable. They lead to protein clustering, um, has an effect on diffusion, probably also has an effect on other things. If the concentrations are high enough, then phase separation is possible. These could be solid phases, although we're more interested in the liquid phases, and we're particularly interested um, in, 
and charge-driven phase separation, and we seem to have evidence that it's possible to form these phase separate states between already positively charged proteins. And so, so the, I think the key insight here, maybe the new idea is, is that this order is, may not be necessary, and also didn't talk about multivalency. So Tanya talked about multivalency, although to make a comment on that, I think the, so spheres with charge are essentially infinitely multivalent. So that's the way I would look at that. Um, so you can look at patchy particles um, and these spacers and stickers that Tanya talked about, but I think spheres are so the ultimate multivalent particle. And so maybe, maybe that's sort of one way to reconcile um, the, what we're seeing here and to see sort of what most people think about when they talk about LPS. All right, so with that, uh, I want to finish. I want to acknowledge people that are uh, involved in this work. Uh, the the large-scale simulations of collaboration with Yuji Sugita's group in, in Japan at Riken. Um, the the course plan simulations are done in, in my lab. Bertrand Tutagachi is leading um, the, that effort. Uh, Jago Shinovratsky was involved. And then the, the experiments that I showed are done by Lisa Lapidus and uh, Joyce Goodluck and then also one Pauline contributed in setting up things, um, some of the systems. Um, just sort of as a, to wrap things up, as we're wrapping things up, so you see there's a very diverse group of people. I think this is how science is done these days. Um, I very much hope it stays this way. There is politics in the US that is going in different directions, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, thank you for listening and uh, happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, we're running a little behind, but let me go ahead and pose a few questions here orally. Um, so the first question, how do you know that this is not, that the phase separation, I guess, is not an artifact of the simplicity of the model and basic immiscibility? It seems that phase separated objects are just growing in size as your system size grows. Will they ever stop growing? Well, they shouldn't. If it's if you have a true phase separation phenomenon, they should actually increase in system size. That that's the difference between phase separation and uh, clustering, where you would have you might have finite size clusters. So the phase separated states should grow. What should stay constant should be the coexistence between the concentration, the high concentration in the phase separated state, and the, the concentration of the molecules in the dilute phase. So if you have, if you increase in size, you should just keep growing in size and the droplets should coalesce. That's a, that's a kinetic question, how long it takes for them to coalesce, but that's what you should see. And Tanya, I think, showed that also in one of her movies. And <clears throat> how is your um, CG approach different from other me methods such as Papu's? I'm curious why you only have tRNAs and not other types of RNAs, like yes, messenger or something. Right, so, so the model at, this, at the coarse grain level, it's basically just a sphere with a charge in the size and it doesn't matter really what kind of RNA functionally we're representing. So we started off with tRNA because that's within the cell that's abundant in the cell in the cytoplasm. Um, we then, the, the experiments that I showed are for this, this other RNA just because it was easier, it was more accessible experimentally. Um, if you have something like mRNA, then the spherical approximation will not be as valid. So what is different? The model, the coarse grain model we use is very simple. It's a, it's a simple spherical model. Papu's model has, uh, I think, residue level resolution. Uh, that is something we should look at as well in the future to bridge between the very high level of the atomistic simulations and the very coarse level of the coarse grain simulations. But the well, we, we really wanted to go out and reach cellular scales. We really wanted to go to be able to go to several hundred nanometers and be able to go to um, millisecond time scales so we can actually see phase separation. Um, so it's difficult to do that with higher resolution models. Uh, so uh, this may be, um, I think, a, point, a good point of clarification. In the RNA and charged protein simulations, the phase separated pictures look very tightly packed compared to the non-phase separated pictures. I'm confused because molecular packing differences are very small, even between solid and liquid phase. So am I missing something? It might be what the way you've drawn the, yeah. So they're highly, that's a good question. So they're highly packed because they're condensed states, but they're still liquid. So 
that's why I showed the movie to to show that they're not they're not frozen into some kind of amorphous solid or gel phase. They're still dynamic. Uh, some of that maybe because of the coarse grain model, but we did some smaller scale atomistic simulations of of packed RNA and protein, and they still move around. So we we think we think that dynamics is retained, although not at the level of a fully dilute state. So the packing, the packing in the in the in the dilute phase, of course, what is what is not shown is uh, there is water, of course, there is uh, um, there are other proteins in there as well that we simply treat as crowders, although in the RNA protein systems they were not there. But there's there's of course there's other material in the cell, so there's not vacuum, just right here and not everything is shown. Right, right. Um, let's see, there was one here about diffusion. Um, so from your simulations, you can probably estimate the time scales for a protein to identify its binding partner or to travel, say, from the ribosome to the cell membrane. Are these time scales too slow, or do they seem compatible with those required for cell regulation in response to stimuli? I'm a physicist. <laughs> I'm not sure, I know much about, about large-scale biological processes, but all right. Um, well, the time scales are there. So the simulation perspective focuses on very short time scales, of course. What we're showing, what we can show is nanoseconds and microseconds, and maybe a little bit of millisecond time scale. Of course, biology happens on seconds and longer time scales. So, 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 so yes, the, the the crowded environment does slow down diffusion and. Uh, by about a factor of 10 of what you would see in dilute phase, maybe a little bit more, but that's about the, the, the right scale. Um, that's still fast enough for biological function. It has an impact, of course, but it's, 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 things are still moving around and the time it takes for proteins to traverse a cell is, is probably in the order of a second or so, or that's still fast enough for function. There was a question which I'm not finding right now, but uh, it had something to do with how do you define what's actually a phase separation? Is there a size um, that you call or a cluster that's, you know, you have to have a minimum size of number of particles or volume size? Yeah, that's a good question too. We struggle with that a little bit. So the, the operational definition that, definition that we use is that 50%, that more than 50% of, of the given molecules in the largest cluster. That would be one way to define that. Uh, you noted that the kappa values can be equated to an approximate salt concentration, but does it matter what the identity of the salt is? Uh, what makes me think of this is that cells are made up of different types of charged species. It, it certainly matters. And so the concentrations that I showed, the tens of millimolar, that's from monovalent salt. It certainly depends on the salt. Divalent ions will um, interact differently and they may facilitate uh, phase separation in different ways because they screen electrostatic interactions. Um, th this is based on a simple debugger model that has a number of deficiencies that have been discussed extensively before. So I... Okay. Uh, I think given the lateness of the hour, we're running a few minutes late here. Um, we've had a lot of good questions answered verbally and there's more here to answer um, in writing. So if the speakers would, I think we have already agreed to kindly uh, take a look at your, your questions. So feel free to, to bring those in um, as you think of more. Uh, and so I would like to now end this uh, second webinar sponsored by the Protein Society. Uh, it's been uh, some really great talks. Thank, I'd like to thank all of the speakers, Bob Griffin, Tanya Mitag, Michael Feig, and um, thank all of the participants for attending and keep uh, track of the website. There will be the recorded uh, versions of these three, all three talks. And also the question and answers, I think we are going to try to be able to get some of that um, posted as well in written format. And finally, uh, keep track of the website for future webinars. Uh, as Amy brought, them, brought up, 
there's, I, what did you say, any three more already in line? So keep, uh, keep an eye on the website. So thanks everyone for attending and participating and the great talks. And Amy, do you have anything else to say? Thank you, Carol, <laughs> for hosting webinar number two and to everybody who showed up. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.